have been recording the latest Hoops and Dreams podcast tomorrow, but instead circumstances have pushed that back two weeks. After odd, eight, sorry, after eight very odd months, and after saving the R's from relegation last season, after a truly dire start to this season, Gareth Ainsworth has finally left the building. It has not come as a shock to us at Hoops and Dreams. In fact, we started planning for this extra podcast last week. Um, but it's sad to see a legend like Gareth fail. Uh, and he takes with him his assistant, Richard Dobson. So nothing usual about this podcast, but I'm glad to have some stability in the shape of uh, regulars, James and Dave, who join me to mull over the news. Uh, welcome to you, lads. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Um, I guess the first thing, if I may, James, um, do you think that this was unexpected? Absolutely not. It's, to me, it's been coming for months. Probably should have happened months ago. We questioned his appointment at the time. At the end of the season, we said the club needed to be brave and sack him then. They didn't. Maybe even in pre-season, his job was in question. You know, going losing at 5-0 at Oxford, it wasn't clear what he was really trying to plan for the season. Then a couple of games into the season, he could have gone. It's just lingered on. Probably should have gone in the international break. They obviously earmarked this Leicester game for him to go because they didn't actually perform that badly. A player's let him down and he's still gone. So this was the line that was drawn in the sand like we predicted in the preview show last week. And is it unexpected? Absolutely not. It's the right decision for me as well. Look at the position we're in in the league table. Action has to be taken. Otherwise, we were going down to League One. Dave, feel the same way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he had to go. I'm afraid it was, you know, it's a shame. I think we all wanted him to do well. We all loved him as a player, and you know, it was a great opportunity for him. But it, it just hasn't worked. You know, part of me thinks they probably should have just shook hands and said goodbye last summer and just said, right, we'll start afresh. But um, it just hasn't worked out. The last couple of months has been pretty poor. I mean, they they were better against Leicester, but just so often there's just no attacking plan to the team and. You know, six points adrift already. You just can't see where a win's coming from. I think I think they had to change it. And it's probably better that he's gone out on a not getting booed out the building. I think if he'd have waited another two weeks, I think it would have been a couple more defeats and he, he would have been getting a lot of stick from the fans. But he went out on a... Even though they lost, it was a mini high because they played quite well yesterday. Yeah, I mean, it had all the signs of the club following the fans in bowing to the, the inevitable, really. Um, the results don't lie, and there was no sign of them changing significantly, even when all the players were fit and available. Um, having said that, the fans know he tried his best, and they've still got a huge respect for him, I think, as a player. Um, and if if they'd have actually lost badly against Leicester, I think people would have been, for sure, crying and booing, you know, all the way through. Um, but now, now's the time, I guess, for him to go. Um, Dave, would you say it was perhaps too late or too soon for him to go? I mean, I, I think he was lucky not to go after that Blackburn game. That was pretty, that was bad. Um, I've obviously thought he might get something at Huddersfield, try and give him a chance for that. I think that was probably the last draw for him. You know, <clears throat> time will tell if they've waited too long. There's still a long way of the season to go, so it's not an impossible job to get out of trouble. You know, six points is a lot, but, you know, there's so many points still to play for, but you know, it's, it's it's the right call to make. Um, you know, I just hope they get this next appointment right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, James, you you sort of hinted that you thought he should have gone in the first international break. Um, still hold to that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, they've only wasted three games. Though. There's still over 30 games of the season. Teams have saved themselves from positions worse than this with fewer games to go. So it's probably a few games too late, but at least we've still got time. And I still, in a way, feel for Ainsworth because I actually think in his heart, he truly believed he could manage QPR in the Premier League. He said it a few times. He mentioned that little graph he'd drawn for the players of where he thought they could go. <laughs> he obviously had true belief in himself that he could manage at this level and could do what he wanted to do. But we're nine games without a win. We've lost the last six. As much as he in his heart believes he can do these things, at some point the team had to show it on the pitch, didn't they? And it's just not happened primarily, like Dave said, attacking-wise, his whole tenure, we haven't scored more than two goals, and we've only done that a few times. You don't turn up at matches thinking, we're going to win, and that's a major issue, and that's probably the main thing the person coming in has got to change, is 
we don't win at Loftus Road and we don't score, Ainsworth's Achilles heel his whole tenure has been those two things. He didn't fix it. What choice have the club been left with in a way? If you, if you don't score goals and you don't have a good home record, you're going to get relegated. It goes hand in hand with a sack in yeah. You look at some of the other teams, Bristol City have sat their manager, obviously, today. Millwall recently sat their manager and they're in better positions than we are. So it's 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 one of those. It just makes sense, really, that it's, it's happened. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I feel there was initially a good co- a good case really for not panicking uh, when we had those first lot of bad results and allowing Gareth time to make a difference. Um, the fact that results for various reasons have gone against us means that that allowance has now been spent. So it, it was the right time, I feel. Uh, OK, as is often the case these days, we don't know the full details as, as the club has remained fairly tight-lipped about this um, departure um but what do you think is behind the decision to act now james from their point of view just the position of the club isn't it literally they they don't want to go down they said it in the fans forum recently that there's they did not want to go down last season they clearly don't want to go down this season there's enough time it's just a results business the club is six points from safety now like dave said we've got rotherham next week which is a huge game I think what cost him ultimately was probably the Huddersfield match because the club could not afford to give three points to Huddersfield at that point. We went from being like a point behind the teams we were chasing and within a week it's just gone like that and all of a sudden it's six points, we're second from bottom. It's it's a results business. It's something I have to change. Yeah, yeah. you're right. I mean, Dave, if we'd have won against uh, Leicester or even drawn, do you think it would have been still the same thing? Um. Yeah, I think it, I think they'd already made their mind up that he was going. I mean, if they'd have won, he would have potentially got another week. You don't, you just don't know. But um, I think they'd, they'd have obviously made their mind up before the Leicester game that he was going to go. I just think it's been, as well as the results, some of the performances recently have just been just really poor. That Blackburn game, I can't get out of my head. That was just so bad. And it was a lot of it was how he was set up. You know, starting a left back at right back that day in Larkesh and the way the midfield was, you just think, I, I, I think he's just kind of lost the plot a bit here. And you, you look at him, I mean, he's, to me, he's looked quite ill the last couple of weeks when he's been doing his pre-match interviews. And you've been, I've been feeling for him a bit. Um, so I think the move's going to, him going is going to do him a bit of good as well, to be honest. Yeah, can I just add in there as well? So I think what's cost him is he talked a good game all the time. Like, we're going to be doing this, we're going to be doing that. We never really saw a Gareth Ainsworth side, did we? And we were all probably for that if we were going to get the ball forward, a bit more impetus in the final third, get men in the box, players scrapping for every ball. Gareth Ainsworth side, as you'd think, we never saw that. And the board maybe were holding on thinking, he keeps talking a good game. Is it going to come next week? Is it going to come next week? And six defeats in a row later, they have, like I say, they have to draw the line somewhere. And we all still hoped we were going to get that Gareth Ainsworth side. We all thought it just never, ever materialised. It's a shame. It could have maybe worked out better for him. Obviously, he's going to be devastated probably that it's gone this way. We said in February he was leaving. Is a job where he probably had a job for life at Wickham to come here and he's lasted eight months. He's going to be devastated and it's a shame. But again, it, he never got to instill his way into QPR. It just didn't work out. And it felt like that was going to be said that in the podcast when he joined. It just didn't feel like the right fit then. And it, he never managed to make it work, did he? No, I, the the hoops and dreams uh, forum, uh, uh, a constant uh, theme there was, what is his style? Nobody seemed to know. You know, you, you're quite right there to bring that up. Um, and, and I think the club probably turned around and said, "Well, look, we've got two matches in the next two weeks. We're away at Rotherham and home to Bristol City. This gives us a chance for players and and, and the new coaching staff to get acquainted and, and get at least two draws out of the games. If you know, if, if we would work with that theory." Uh, then we enter into the second international break. And I, I would imagine the club thought, well, this will give him a chance, you know, the new manager or coach to work with most of the players. Uh, and, and they can work on the playing style that we still really didn't know for Gareth what he wanted. Uh, and then use tactics that were going to work against the next opponents, which after that, it's Norwich away and Stoke at home. So these are, you know, no small, no small sides we're talking about. Okay, let, let's look forward now we've looked back let's let's look forward i mentioned the playing style to be adopted dave what changes do you envisage in the way we set up and play 
<clears throat> they've got to make changes to how they attack. I mean, it, it's just been basically a long ball over the top to Armstrong the last couple of weeks, and he wasn't playing yesterday. They, they've got to try and find a way to get chair on the ball a lot more in the attacking third and try and get Willock. I don't understand why Willock hasn't played at all. Like, he come on for two minutes yesterday. It's like, what's the point? Um, I, I don't know. That, that's something I just can't get my head around. Where he was a year ago, he was our best player by a million miles, and you think he's going to go on to big things, and he can't even get into t- this team now, which is a pretty poor team. So I think the new manager's got to get his arm around Willock and get him playing and get, you know, because that's how we're going to win games. You, you, likes of Cher and Willock are going to, they're the ones that can create chances and score goals. And we've got to get them on the ball a lot more. And we, you know, we've got to get them in good areas. And James, what do you think about setting up the, to play and win? Completely agree with Dave. To me, I've said it for months. If you become manager of QPR, you surely look who's your best players, Cher <laughs> and Willock. On paper, they're the best players anyway. I'm sure everyone would agree. I know Willock is starting to split opinion a little bit, but if you can get your arm around him and give him confidence and get him playing to his ability with chair, it's them linking up that makes all the difference. If you can get them getting those little triangles, get Pal involved down the side, that's what opens up teams and it gets us playing in the opposition half. I completely want to get us get rid of this idea that we can just sit back and just have 20% possession and just break on teams. Because as we see, it works, what, one game in 10, you might pull it off. It's not good enough for a consistent approach to get points. So it is Chair and Willock. And the new manager, whoever it may be, has got to improve the mentality of the players. We can't keep having these 4-0 implosions and going behind in games. I know we've seen some signs it's better against Leicester, but... It still have we have four nils all the time, three ones, three nils. We can't keep having results like that. We've got to be competitive in every game if we want to try and survive. Yeah. yeah. I I always hope that Gareth Ainsworth would set up the R's to defend well and then punish opponents on the break. I thought that was the best we could hope with with this squad. But neither has happened, sadly. Um and I feel that when somebody comes in, this is probably the first thing they're going to do is try and defend well and go for you know ones on the break. Um, okay, it would it be unfair not to mention the obstacles put in the way of Gareth Ainsworth uh, as he sought to turn matters around. He brought in some good defenders in Cook, Fox, Lakesh, and Cannon, only to get injuries affecting Cook, Fox, and Dunn. Uh, and he tried to give development players like Armstrong, Duke McKenna and Coley opportunities to shine. But they're either still unpolished or inadequate. Um, His reliance upon Chair, Willock and Dykes to score has been optimistic. Uh, And he's had a squad where where, where those little qualities that we had only stretch as far as the starting eleven. There's no depth there. Um, These obstacles that I've mentioned are, are largely still there, James. So how will any new manager make a difference? I think it comes down to just tactical now and how to set a team up. I don't think Ainsworth quite knew how to extract the best in the team. And I found sometimes it didn't matter whether he had a few players missing. There was very little difference in our performance levels. You could take a few players out, like Colback missed a few games. When he came back in, it didn't make a great difference to the team, did it? Um, you can move field from midfield to defence. We're largely still the same team. So as much as the squad depth is an issue, and that should have been resolved in the summer, obviously... I think it comes down to how you set a team up. Someone out there must know how to, like I say, cajole a few players, get them some confidence, tell them where to pick up the ball, where to play. There's just going to be a little bit more nuance about how we play rather than, like Dave said, our only plan seems to be channel ball for Armstrong or hope Dykes can flick this to somebody. It doesn't work. It's got to be on another level tactically, and that's where Ainsworth ultimately has fallen down. Um he had all the heart and the integrity that Beal didn't have, but he just didn't seem to have the ability as the coach. I saw that on Twitter today and thought that was a, a good quote. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, do you think the same? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it is, a, it is a shame how his words out for Ainsworth. And he's had it. He has had it hard. Whoever comes in, this is not an easy job. Like I say, there's no depth beyond that first 11, really. You know, the academy hasn't produced enough players to, to support the first team, really. There's no money to spend and unless this um stadium deals worth a lot more, you know, money that can bring in, I don't know. But 
you know, it's it it was a difficult job for Ainsworth. Let's make no bones about it. You know, I, I don't think he's come into a really good team and and messed it up completely. You come into a mess, and it's still a mess. And you know, whoever comes in has got a really hard job on their hands to keep this team up because um, we're definitely one of the worst six teams in this league comfortably, and um, they're going to do well to get out of this. Yeah, we've got to be in the top six of those bad ones. Um, yeah. I. I always hate seeing players having to play out of position uh, and injuries have, have really caused that recently. Um, and I think that's likely to continue. I can't see that changing. Uh, and we don't have enough skilled players in the squad, as I said before, that are capable of covering all those positions adequately. So we're going to get this happening. We're going to be asking senior pros to cover multitude of places. You know, And, and, and as James said, Field's been here, there and everywhere. I mean, he is fantastic, but he's not that fantastic that he can cover everything and still survive. Um, so the new manager, when he comes in, will have to cope with that. And he's also, at the same time, going to have to try and reinstate confidence because there's no doubt about it. There is a low confidence level at the moment. Uh, you know, and areas perhaps for the new manager or coach, whatever he's going to be, to consider are playing chair and perhaps we'll look in their best positions, you know, as you pointed out pushing Dizelle forward to link the defence with the attack and sorting out the abysmal story, scoring record. I mean, that really is a, a major worry, as you you know, you know both pointed out. Uh, in truth, we're, we're not the worst side in the championship. You know, and a new manager should be capable of lifting us out of, out of the, where we are in the league. And hopefully far enough up that we don't have to worry quite so much. Um, and that brings us, I suppose, to the thorny question of who comes in. Do we wait perhaps for a promising young foreign coach to become available in January, perhaps, or May? Um, and, and, or do we and do we settle for a sort of a, perhaps a, some 74-year-old to come in who's called Neil Warnock uh, and, and manage in the meanwhile, Dave? Is he the saviour? Well, I mean, he's done it several times before, hasn't he? He's done it at Rotherham <laughs> and he's done it last year at Huddersfield. Warnock seems the obvious um, option for Amir. You know, they're in massive trouble. He'll come in, he'll lift everyone. You know, he knows what he's doing. He's going to have the respect to the dressing room. Everyone knows how good a manager he is. So he seems the obvious choice. I kind of assume that's where they're going to go with it. But there are other options out there. I mean, John Eustace just lost his job at Birmingham. I think he's a good manager and he's been there before. I like the Notts County manager, Luke Williams. I think he's really good. But do you put someone like that in who's a young kind of unknown manager into this situation? They're probably doomed to failure a bit. But... um. I would have thought it's going to be uh, Warnock or Eustace, to be honest, to be one of them too. Dave? Sorry, James, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's going to be Warnock because it literally is a major salvage operation. We can't try and plan too far ahead and think, oh, let's get like a, a continental manager who comes in and tries to instill a certain way and let's go long term and think where we're going to be in 18 months. That's not the case, is it? We we need to just survive in this league, look at the league table it has to be Warnock for me because of that. He isn't a long-term option, obviously, but the only long-term goal we can have now is surviving in this league and not ending up in League One. It, you can't think much further than that. Warnock is the name for me. He gives me the most confidence that we'll have a chance of survival. I don't think he's going to guarantee it because it is a tough job for everything we've been talking about, <laughs> but he will give the board and the fans, from the minute he comes in, they're going to think, we're going to think, We've got a shot now. We we could survive. Is it the right appointment for the long term? People are going to argue, obviously not. But like I say, for me, you can't think any further than where are we going to be next season? And he gives you the opportunity as well to spend the next eight months scouting the, the whole country, the continent for the next best options. The, the club should be putting together a list of if we're in the championship, we want these coaches. If we're in League One, we'll do this. But well, they've got the time to plan, so we're in a stronger position wherever we are next summer. Neil Warnock gives you that opportunity, whilst also giving you probably the best opportunities to stay in this league. Um, and age doesn't matter. Look at Roy Hodgson; he's still doing all right, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, yeah, I, I, I fully accept what you're saying. I think uh, you've got to look for somebody at this stage. I think who's going to be a, a player motivator. It can't be the sort of manager who just turns up, puts the sheet up on the board and then walks away. It has to be somebody who really is going to motivate them. And, and maybe Neil Warnock is the best for it. I mean, there was media talk today about um, Sabri Lamucci, uh, who, who used to be at Forest and, and Cardiff. Uh, and also, we've got 
Nigel Pearson, as you said, who was sacked today by Bristol City uh, above us. Uh, and then there's Mark Warburton, or, or dare I say it, uh, Beale. Um, there are other other good choices out there. Uh, some I wouldn't trust, um, but you know there are other trusts, other possibilities out there. Um, I don't know enough about um, Sabri Lamucci to offer an opinion. I, I honestly don't know. Um, if you look at it, the other managers, uh, as Dave said, I would perhaps look at John Eustace purely because he knows the club. And there's something to prove of, uh, after doing so well at Birmingham and being replaced purely because his name wasn't Wayne Rooney. Um, so for me, that 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 would be a, a person who would work very very hard, and he seems to work well with the the uh, the players as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. These are I'd like to say these are exciting times, but they're not, are they really? Well, the thing uh, with John Eustace is what the what the board are going to look at is compared to Warnock. I would like John Eustace to be QPR manager, but maybe from next summer onwards or something like that. I think the board are going to look at, he has never gone into a club mid-season and had to save them from the position we're in. Warnock has. That's going to be the board's ultimate consideration. And Huddersfield last season, with 11 games left, they were seven points from safety. We've got 32 games left and it's only six points. So he's, if he can save Huddersfield last season, he can save QPR this season. That is ultimately what I think the board are going to look at. And obviously, he has a really good relationship with Amit Batir as well from when he was here last time. I think it's just inevitable it's going to be Warnock. I'd be more than happy if it was Eustace, less so than some of the other names, but Eustace or Warnock, I just ultimately convinced it is going to be Warnock for the reasons I keep saying. He'd love it for a win Warnock, you think. We sacked him when we was in the Premier League, and I don't think he was ever very happy with that decision. We overlooked him for the manager a few years later, and he was definitely not happy That's about true. that. So he's gonna, you know, he's got something to prove, and he'd be like, you know, in his in his head, and I think what most people think is he'll keep us up, and then say, "See, should never have got rid of me in the first place," and, you know, <laughs> and then he can sail off into the distance, you know. But um, yeah, he, he's. I mean, I imagine Warnock will, will want this job. To be honest, when you look at the available ones, but we'll see. I tell you what, he'd be right, though, wouldn't he? A QPR never recovered from sacking him, really, have we? We should have just kept him where we were back 12 years ago. Um, Last thought for you. Do you think if we'd have had a director of football in place, uh, this would be a lot easier process? (laughs) Yes, 100%. I don't know (laughs) why we haven't replaced Les Ferdinand. He left months ago. This should have been done by now. I get they wanted... When they said at the time, we're going to take our time and think about this, like, yeah, I, I get what you're doing there. It's October now. Come on, do something. You know, don't just sit there. You know, it, it would make things a lot easier. And you're in a position that's probably why it will be war, not that you still haven't got a director of football. So you're kind of you're looking to bring someone in to oversee. It. You've got owners who, you know, they do their best and they obviously care about the club, but they they're not don't seem to know what they're doing a lot of the times. You need someone in there to try and run things. And um, I don't know why I haven't brought someone in yet. It seems mad to me. James? Yeah, I mean, I think what happened, though, is the problem. No one made any moves in the club, getting rid of anyone, sacking anyone, until much later in the summer, and it's left them, like, chasing the tail, hasn't it? I don't know why, at the end of last season, it wasn't just a complete swipe of everybody who could, who could get, toss them overboard, of everybody, Lee Hughes, Les Ferdinand, everybody. It should have been a complete reset. The fact that it was only Les who went is a shambles anyway. Now we've got Lee Hughes calling the shots, who is literally, I think, <laughs> public enemy number one now at QPR, isn't he? It's just a mess. It's a mess. And I don't know how they sort it out, really, because one director of football isn't going to change enough, I don't think. There should have been more people up for getting their job sorted out. And maybe it's going to be next summer. But again, I feel like we've wasted a whole year. It was clear last summer that we needed to have like a hard reset of the club. You only have to look at, like, we keep, we, like, people keep saying the youth players aren't good enough, and they're not. We've got people like Drew, Gubbins. They're clearly old enough now to be good enough if they are, but they're still hanging around. We've got owners who show up once a year, players who've got a losing mentality, but we still kept them. In the summer, we should have overhauled a lot more of the squad. I know FFP hamstrung us, but it's not just the director of football, is it? The whole club needed sorting mm-hmm. out, and I don't know how you do that in the middle of the season. It should have happened last summer. Hopefully we can survive now and do it next summer. Remind me not to ask James again about director of football. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, our time is just about up now on this uh, Hoops and Dreams special podcast. 
So can I thank my special guests, James and Dave? We all got together in a very short time for this one, and uh, it's, it has worked, thank God. And I'd also like to thank you all for watching. These are troubling times for the club. Uh, it's a club that we all love, so please try to support the club and the players even more than usual. Uh, do click on subscribe if you're watching this on our YouTube channel. Uh, and do add a comment or two below. As you probably noticed, uh, we do respond whenever we can. Um, I'm Brian Fisher, and this has been a Hoops and Dreams special podcast. Come on, you ours. We know who we are. You know who we are. We are QPR.